How are you, Corey? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing good. We're here to talk about Password to Larks for Lane, number 10 of the original Nancy Drew mystery stories. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so, and we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to Regular Nancy Drew. First impressions, Corey. First impressions. Should we do our three words? Sure, 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 sure. Fabulous. Fabulous. (laughs) Fabulous. <laughs> Floral. Floral. And frightening. We had some legit yeah. scary moments in this. Oh, it was. It was mm-hmm. very tense. This, it, I mean, it was just so good. Mm-hmm. Just so good. Like, when I think about Nancy Drew, like, this this book is exactly what I think about when I think about Nancy Drew. It has literally all of the, like, great like great nancy drew qualities like nancy just knowing random information nancy being in like some seriously scary dangerous situations but that she's incredibly calm throughout a very complex very complex mystery Mm -hmm. um and also like she randomly she's it's it's set in river heights Mm -hmm. um and so she knows everyone Nancy, everybody's just like, oh, hey, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Nancy's like, my close personal friend, this guy, my close personal friend, this person. Uh, it's just, it's just so good. Mm-hmm. I think the only classic Nancy Drew trope that this was missing was the secret passageway. And even then, yeah. you could argue that we found some within within the mansion that we end up mm. in the end. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah it's got everything. It's it great. Really <laughs> Definitely. We'll rate it at the end, but definitely if you are thinking about getting back into Nancy Drew or even just revisiting some Nancy Drew, I would highly, highly recommend Password to Larks Berlin. It's a good I, one. I love it a lot. So this one was ghostwritten by Walter Kerrig. Mm-hmm. Want to talk about that? Yeah, I read that he wrote he wrote books numbers 8, 9, and 10. So this is the last of his three that he wrote for the Stratomider. Stratemeyer Syndicate. Um, and I also read that he was, I guess, fired after writing this one because Ooh. he revealed to the Library of Congress that he was Carolyn Keene for these three novels. <gasps> and that was a big no no. Wow. That's crazy. I did not know that. I did not realize that. Mm-hmm. So I, I was mostly struck by the fact that this Nancy Drew book that I liked the most out of all the ones that we've read so far, which granted is only three. Right. But it was written by a man. It was written by a man. I feel betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> I was really surprised to learn that. I think that there's a few few differences in maybe the way Nancy's written. We'll talk about it later, but I, I think Bess is written a little bit differently mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. story as well. I do think it's also much more of an adventure story. Like there's a, like we talked a little bit about how Nancy is put into much more dangerous situations than mm-hmm. usual. Um, and also I just, there's just like a lot more going on. Like Nancy is going places and more actively investigating than I think we've seen in necessarily other situations where it seems like Nancy may have just been around yeah. <laughs> when, when stuff happened. Um, Nancy was felt much more, uh, uh, well, not, not productive. What's the word? Uh, active. Yeah, I guess active. Yeah. An active, an active character in this, as opposed to a passive one. That makes me wonder whether or not we get those things because it was a, a male author, not because a female author couldn't write an active Nancy, mm-hmm. but because an editor probably decided that it was acceptable in this case, <laughs> and that he might know more about what he was talking about in that kind of a writing about that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Just something to keep in mind. <laughs> so the book was originally published in 1933, I believe, and then much like the earlier books in the series, it was rewritten in 1966 by Harriet Stratemeyer Adams. If you listen to our Shadow Ranch episode, you might remember that the original version versus the rewritten version were two totally different stories. Uh, I did not read the original version in this case. I think we both read the 60s version, but as far as I can tell, there's not that much of a difference. It is by and large the same plot with maybe a few additions to the newer one. Yeah, that's a great point too. Yeah, this was then rewritten by 
<laughs> or re-edited, I guess, mm -hmm. um, by a woman. So, you know, you never know. You never know where it all came from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to get started with chapter one? Sure. So this was a very interesting and start to the to the book, I thought. Mm -hmm. Typically, or like an interesting start to the mystery, because I feel like typically it's it's very narrative. Like we like at the start of the mystery, it's Nancy explaining a mystery to someone or um, us having a mystery explained to us as the reader. But mm -hmm. instead, it's like the mystery just just kicks off with a clue. Like we yes. just get a weird, a weird occurrence that Nancy is like, oh, this is strange. I want to investigate. So instead of us having a mystery explained, um, we are basically essentially introduced to the mystery with Nancy. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, it was nice. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that she's in the garden getting flowers for a flower show with Hannah. And... <laughs> A pigeon falls out of the sky <laughs> and basically like almost smacks into them. <laughs> but it came out of a, a plane. She thinks that there was a plane that was flying by at the same time also. And it seems that either the the pigeon hit the plane or the plane threw the pigeon out because we do find out that the pigeon is a carrier pigeon and has a message attached to it. Nancy does figure that out pretty much immediately, recognizes this as a trained carrier pigeon, and she makes a remark. <laughs> I'm so glad you're going to say this. She was <laughs> like, oh, well, obviously I need to call the, yeah. I made a note of this, the International Federation of American Homing Pigeon Fanciers. Fan <laughs> fanciers? I guess. Homing yeah. Pigeon Fanciers. She just knows that. She just knows it off the top of her head. She just, she just is knows it off the top of her head oh i've had a pigeon fall in my yard i know exactly <laughs> who to contact knows exactly how to get in contact with them and knows that that's the next step that she has to take this is the nancy drew that i love and remember the nancy who knows literally the most random information can pull it out of her head at the drop of a hat mm -hmm. and like also just like has the wherewithal yes. to <laughs> just just immediately follow it up that's that's my nancy drew she is, yeah. So the message is, trouble here. After five o'clock, bluebells will be singing horses. Come tonight. That's a weird, it's a weird message. It is a weird message. But so Nancy at this moment is very confused about that. But then she does um, decide that she, they, they're very concerned about the pigeon, which I thought was very sweet. Yes. She tells the pigeon to do get well and, you know, wants to take care of it. But, but <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> is that instead of any time spent, you know, nursing this pigeon or trying to get it to drink water, oh, I think she tries to get it to drink a little water. Um, she puts it in a box, puts a lid on the box, and puts it in the garage yeah. <laughs> on a shelf and just leaves it there. She just leaves it there. She doesn't try to keep it warm. She doesn't, she doesn't carry it with her. She doesn't take it to a vet, which seems like a natural extension of <laughs> Of what you would do if she knows that she has to contact the Federation of American Homing Pigeon whatevers <laughs> to figure out more about this pigeon. She doesn't know she should take a bird to the vet if it's been injured. Yeah. I don't know. Or at least poke air holes in the box. <laughs> Seems just like you, the bird is going to get carbon monoxide poisoning in your garage. <laughs> oh. But no, the bird will be fine. We have other more pressing things to take care of, like right. choosing our flowers for the flower show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which we do. We go to the flower show. We drop off our arrangement. And on the way back, we see our family doctor. Yeah. In a really a weird call. situation. Not a house call exactly, more like a car call. Yeah. Um, because he just drives off the side of the road and there's a car parked there and he goes around to the back of the car and then disappears inside of it and the car drives off. And Nancy's like, hold on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Was he just kidnapped? But instead of like, you know, calling the police or following the car, which is something that Nancy would do in a situation, she just goes, oh, well, <laughs> and drives away. <laughs> I hope that was nothing. <laughs> yeah, I hope that was fine. <laughs> Uh, then in chapter two, we actually have an excuse to go talk to the doctor. Um, our author injures Hannah. Mm -hmm. So we end up in the doctor's office anyway to figure out what happened with him. Mm -hmm. So they take Hannah to the doctor. 
Uh, and Dr. Spire just waltzes back through the door. Like, I've returned now for my mm -hmm. harrowing car call earlier this morning. And he tells Nancy that he was, in fact, kidnapped. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, <laughs> he was pulled into the car by the shoulders, a bag put over his head so he can't see where they're going. They drive for about an hour. He hears them say some sort of password at the gate to wherever they're going to. There, he the bags take off his head. He's asked to provide medical care for this elderly woman. The nurse instructs him not to try to talk to the patient, not to try to get any information from her, just treat her and be done. And then they take him home. Um, but while he was treating her, when the nurse looks away, the elderly woman slips him a bracelet. And he gives the bracelet to Nancy as a, a can you try to track this, figure out what the significance is of this bracelet or who this woman was and where we were. Um, and he talks about the password to the gates being bluebells. And then Nancy immediately kind of takes note of that. And is like, okay, I get it. I get it. I get the mystery message. It only took one chapter to figure it out. <laughs> she doesn't tell us that, but you could tell. I mean, you can catch on at this point. Yes. <laughs> So what I did really like about this chapter, something super sweet, is that, yeah, when Nancy is making dinner after Hannah's injured and they, they get back, she makes dinner for her and her dad. And he, that, he says to her that he wants to do anything he can to help her with this new mystery or whatever. And then she says, oh, then you can start clearing the table um, and I'll scrape the dishes and put them in the washer. And then they make a little bit of a joke about it. But... But then it says, but he was Nancy's willing helper. And it did not take the father-daughter team long to tidy the kitchen. And it's just a very domestic moment. But I just thought it was, it was so, such a, just such a sweet moment. Because mm -hmm. I feel like typically, even in the 60s at this time, I mean, we weren't quite into second wave feminism, at, even at that point. Right. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about like Nancy and her dad having this, this relationship where like he'll he's going to help her like do all this domestic stuff, you know, when their housekeeper is injured or, or what, I mean, that's, that's another conversation that they have a housekeeper and, yeah. um, and that, but that when like, you know, when called upon, he's not, he's not afraid to support Nancy mm -hmm. in whatever it is that she's asking of him. And I just thought that that was, that was just really cool. It was. It was really <laughs> nice. Okay. So at the end of chapter two, she, they decide to, they decide to go contact the police on behalf of the doctor. Right. Is that right? So they're going to go into town to the police station. She drops Carson off at the door while she goes to look for parking. Uh, but there's nowhere to park close to the police station. So she drops off her dad and she goes to park, I guess, just like a, down the street, a little bit of ways or whatever. And then she gets... Um, confronted by a stranger with a deep voice. This was a legitimately scary scene. Yeah. yeah. Especially for those of us who have had experiences, you know, walking down the street at night in a city mm -hmm. and, um, you know, people might follow you. Uh, you know, you carry your car keys between your fingers. Uh, this is kind of uh, like a woman's worst nightmare is to be confronted alone you know, getting out of her car in a parking lot at mm -hmm. night. And a man grabs you from behind. A man grabs you from behind, yeah. But Nancy plays it cool. She well, does. first of all, she says, let me go or I'll scream. Well, she should have screamed already. And he does. He just lets her go. Which He's I like, oh, gosh. Like, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad, Nancy. But, you know, I thought that was a little unrealistic. But then he just basically wants her to pass on a, a threatening message to her dad because at this point, I am guessing that he's assuming that her dad is the one investigating this mystery and not Nancy. So there's a little benefit to being to being a woman here. I feel like this book explores gender quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we got that little moment with Nancy and Carson in the chapter before. And now mm -hmm. we're kind of getting a moment where Nancy is threatened by a man. But the man doesn't uh, consider her a threat. Um you know, he is assuming that it is her father that is the true, the true danger to him. Uh, and so I thought that was just great. <laughs> I'm 
this, but she plays it off. She mm -hmm. denies even being Nancy Drew. Um, right. And then, of course, seconds later, people <laughs> she knows run into her. Hey, Nancy Drew. Yeah. Uh, and start asking her about mysteries she solved lately. This this really actually had me shaking a little bit when he comes back and says, good night, Miss Drew. Yeah. And we overheard the conversation. Yeah, she hears a soft laugh in the shadows. Freaking creepy. That is some creepy stuff. Just to let her know, I know who you really are, and I'm watching, and I'm following you. That freaks me out. Nancy is not phased, though. And I was baffled as to, so she literally just moments after that walks into the police station mm -hmm. to, you know, help her father report this crime. And she doesn't tell the police about this. <laughs> she, she just talks about the doctor's kidnapping, which, you know, yeah, for sure, report that like you said you're going to nancy but baby just also mentioned oh, by the way there was a creepy guy who grabbed me just now and threatened you dad so maybe we should also let the lieutenant know about that little situation nancy's very selective with what she tells the police she does and i think that i mean i know this is, this is a trope in in detective stories right is that you have to keep information from the police right because you have to do the detecting yourself uh, so I get I get it as as a plot device and I get it as, you know, kind of the characterization of a detective. Mm -hmm. But I just think it's just Nancy, who is so straight laced and is always willing to consult with the police or whatever. Just sometimes I'm just dumbfounded by the things she doesn't chooses to and chooses to not say because mm -hmm. there doesn't seem to be much benefit to keeping that information to yourself when there's this guy <laughs> out there trying to threaten you it's not like you know uh, even if you want to investigate who he is it would be more helpful if more people were looking into where this guy is so they can arrest him right <laughs> and we do actually find out who he is very soon after this because carson's right. like oh it must be this guy yeah she does she does tell her father about it but later post police station she tells her and then um that that's because they get followed again as they're leaving the police station, I guess by the by the same car. And Nancy does an entire like 180 in her car at the stoplight. Like she's first of all, she does not she does not go faster than the speed limit. This is a, this is a great moment where Nancy Nancy goes as fast as the law allows. Did you specify that? Yes, um, which is kind of a famous Nancy Drewism. But she uses a a light or a, what I assumed was a um, a traffic light. Yeah, she uses a traffic light turning red as an excuse to do a full 180 in her car. Like, I just imagine, like, you know, Fast and Furious style. Just like, Fast and Furious Nancy Drew. <laughs> totally turns, flips around, and then starts following the guy, following them. That is badass. It is. I almost had trouble picturing this scene just because it seems so uncharacteristic for Nancy to just be like, all right, let's do some speed racer stuff in my convertible. It was awesome. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Um, so then after that, you know, because um, Carson looks in the car and he sees the guy. And so he recognizes him as Adam Thorne, an attorney that he used to work with who was disbanded and arrested for some kind of financial crime, I forget. Mm -hmm. And Carson actually helped make the case for him to get disbarred. So he's got right. this grudge against Carson, which explains why he's coming after Nancy making these threats. Yeah. So basically, Carson is also a detective. He is his sleuth on other cases before. So maybe mm -hmm. this is where Nancy gets it. And maybe this is why he's so supportive, is because this is actually legitimately also his profession. He just... Yeah happens to be a lawyer as well. So, you know, calling back to, or I guess calling forward to the mystery of the 99 steps, maybe we were a little bit wrong at thinking it was weird for Carson to go out and investigate something because maybe it seems like he has a little bit of a history of, of doing this before, which I wasn't aware of. He does kind of see Nancy as his equal in, in crime solving and, and sleuthing. Mm hmm. So they, they do make it home, they check on Hannah, and we are introduced to the to Effie, <laughs> uh, Hannah's niece, who um, is going to come over to the Drew's home to help out, I guess, making food and, and, you know, with housekeeping duties and all of that stuff. Right. 
And what a what a job is this where if you are too injured to work, you have to get a relative to fill in for you. Also, yeah, for sure. Bizarre. Hannah doesn't get sick days, apparently. I guess not. So Effie, we got a lot of description of Effie. She's she's very well explored as a character for who is not in it for very long. Maybe she recruits yeah. other books, I'm not sure. But she's a thin 17-year-old girl with light blonde hair, feathery bangs, dressed in a Chinese style pink kimono. She does seem she does seem like a, a cool girl, aside from, you know, the cultural appropriation thing with the kimono, but who knows? And so she comes along with Nancy. Nancy does seem a little annoyed with Effie. She does, especially, uh, it's later, but the bird scene where they're following the bird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, then she goes to the jewelry store to investigate the bracelet that the doctor gave her. To try to trace it. Um, The jeweler just happens to know, oh, I guess I should say first that someone, she finds, she sees a lady watching her outside the jeweler's um, through Mm -hmm. the window. Um, but the jeweler just happens to know an expert on family crests. <laughs> Which happens to be on the bracelet. Right. Um, so he's able to send a letter to him and will let her know in a couple of days what he finds out from this family crest expert. Again, just another random information that someone just happens to know that Nancy happens to have a friend who, a personal friend who works in a jewelry store, who happens to have a personal friend who's an expert on the family crest. I just, mm-hmm. It's just one of those those classic classic Nancy Drew situations, I think. Yeah, to, to help her figure out this mystery of this doctor that she personally knows and is a family friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but as she le- goes to leave the jewelry store, um, a woman takes her handbag and runs away with it. And pushes her into the street. Oh, yeah. But she's okay. Luckily, she's okay. Some people catch her before she hits the ground. But then we get this incredible chase scene. <laughs> it is. It's, it really, it quite, it goes on. So, like, Nancy runs to chase her through a department store, up a set of escalators, into a dressing room, out of the department store, down the street, um, where she does eventually get into a cab and rides away. But it's just, it's quite an intense, like, it's quite prolonged. Yeah. Yeah. This would make a great movie. It really would. We get a lot of action scenes. I think scenes. so. It's a lot that I would like to see. The car chase, this scene. Yeah, and I kind of do, I feel like, I mean, the Emma Roberts, Nancy Drew movie, I definitely I definitely like, I definitely have a lot of issues with it. <laughs> I haven't but seen I, it in so long. I, can't oh, even. I, thought you, I thought you were about to say you hadn't seen it ever. I, I, I have, it. just like not since like 2007 or whenever yeah. it came out. Oh, yeah. I feel like I, I do a somewhat regular rewatch of it. But yeah. I, I feel like overall the vibe of this book is very much the vibe of that movie because I feel like the character of Nancy in the, the Emma Roberts adaption is very, very similar to who Nancy, you know, actually is. Mm-hmm. Even though I think she's portrayed a little bit younger than than she should be, but um, so I f- I feel like if the Emma Roberts adaptation was done right, it would be this book. You know, right. instead of taking place in L.A., it could have taken place in River Heights, and we could have gotten like this this story. It would have been it would have been so it would have been so good. Mm-hmm. Movie producers, take if you need ideas. <laughs> Password to Larks for Lane's a great one. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so she also happens to just know the person working in the department store. She has the great idea to call as the woman runs out of the, the store to call someone down the street in, in, I guess, a silverware store to stop her. Oh, I thought it was the silverware department. It was just downstairs in the department oh, store. Oh, She gets the idea I to call see. to another department. She sees her running in that direction. So she calls. That makes so much more sense. And the silverware lady is just like, wait, what? Hold on. <laughs> there was a lady that already ran out of here. What do I do? I was like, well, it's too late now because she took 20 minutes to go check. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, so she gets away. Um, but then as Nancy is leaving, she meets Helen Corning. Now, Helen Archer. Mm-hmm. So Helen was Nancy's like first friend from Secret of the Old Clock, the very first Nancy friend that we meet. And this book is so mm-hmm. exciting because we get the whole gang. We have Helen. Later, we'll see Bess and George. Ned's in this one. Yeah. Oh, so we we did not say, I forgot to say, that she does get her purse back 
and the bracelet. She's able to grab it out of her hand when she's in the dressing room. Um, so she does get all that stuff back. Um, but yeah, so she meets Helen Corning, but now Helen Archer, who is, I guess, married to Jim Archer, which I, I haven't read Secret of the Old Clock in a long time. So my only reference point for this is, <laughs> is the computer game. I hope that's not who she's married to. I really hope she's not married to that dude because he's he's not super impressive and also I think portrayed as being a lot older than her in <laughs> in that game. Uh, but that was just like my the mental image that I got when she was right. like, "Oh, Mrs. Jim Archer." I was like, "Oh, oh no." <laughs> No, Helen, no. Yeah. I did read Secret of the Old Clock recently, and there wasn't a character named Jim Archer in that one. It might have been in, like, the original, original one. I read the, the 60s version of it, or the 59, I guess, version of it. I know that the game is kind of based on the first three novels, so I wonder if he's from one of those, and we see Helen get married. Maybe we, we get more of their story there. But uh, I will give props to her interactive here doing their research. Yeah. That, the place that Nancy's going to do the flower show at is actually called the Blenheim Estate, which is a reference to one of the places that you can drive to in the game, the, oh, yeah. the Blenheim Nursery. So. It is, isn't mm -hmm. it? I totally missed that. That is that is very cool. Just a little Easter egg for you there. I love that. That's so fun. That is very fun. Uh, but yeah, anyway, we, we meet Helen just walking down the street. She invites her to come help her or to have dinner with her the next day because she has to ask for her help with the mystery. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she invites her to have dinner with her um, gram and gramp, her grandmother and grandfather, who have a house on a hill next to Sylvan Lake, mm -hmm. which we haven't heard about. I haven't heard about before, but I guess it's just a pretty lake. So she does that. And then she goes home and she meets the pigeon man. <laughs> yes, the pigeon man is waiting for her in her living room. And he introduces himself. He um, checks out the pigeon and the message and tells her that, you know, this is the second pigeon they found with an unregistered number. They mentioned this to a detective and he thinks that it's criminals using pigeons in the area to communicate. And he goes to take the, the bird and Nancy's like, no, 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 no. Can I keep the bird, please? I'm keeping the bird. <laughs> I'm keeping the bird. And he's like, yeah, sure. I guess if you want to, whatever. <laughs> But because Nancy has the idea to try to follow the pigeon once it gets well again. But then we have another scary moment. Right. With who we assume is Adam Thorns and his gang of buddies. Yeah, somebody knocks on the door and Nancy goes to open it and it's dark. Somebody must have, or like the bulb must have gone out or something must have well, happened. She flips the, the switch and no light comes on. Right. And she just hears, like, she, she calls out because she thinks it's her father, but no one answers. And she just hears someone heavy breathing. Ugh! This is so creepy. <laughs> so gross. Oh, another, another worse nightmare. But this is much more like, uh, much more horror movie nightmare than, uh, than I think your everyday normal fears. <laughs> is that, you know, you answer the door and nobody's there. And all you hear is... That kind of thing. <laughs> and Nancy again shouts, Who's there? Yeah. A rasping whisper says, Never mind who. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but then luckily Carson does drive up and I guess scares whoever that is away with the headlights. And Nancy tells him, tells him about it and saying that it sounded like the same guy who grabbed her in the parking lot. <laughs> so yeah. Adam Thorne. Carson says he'd like to wring his neck. Carson getting violent. I know. So Carson wants to go tell the police about this now, finally. But first Nancy asks him to drive her to the flower show. <laughs> so Nancy is totally unbothered by this. So unbothered that they want to, she wants to make a stop at the flower show before, mm -hmm. before going to talk to the police. This is just right. hilarious. So we, we go over to the Blenheim Nursery. We see that Nancy, with her bouquet of larkspurs, has won first prize. Blue oh, ribbon. Of course Round she of did. applause for Nancy. Congratulations. So, so easy for Nancy to win the flower show after literally just picking flowers out of a garden, putting it in a vase, in the middle of all of the mystery stuff going on. She just leaves it there. Like, it's just... <laughs> 
Fancy with all her skills. Oh, flower arranging. I need to add that to the yes. list. <laughs> she just has time to be a like a botany expert. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To raise prize flowers just in her front yard. I'm definitely adding flower arranging. So I already have assessing pigeons for broken bones. Because she does that and she determined there was none. So Nancy's not a vet, but Nancy has some kind of veterinary skills. Flower arranging. So she also cooks, so I put cooking. Fast and Furious-esque driving. And then there's later we'll get to a water rescue. So I put that down as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, flower flower arranging. I missed I missed that one. So we, we get the first prize ribbon and the news photographer comes over to Nancy and asks to get her picture with her arrangement. So Nancy starts posing for her picture and out of nowhere, a giant vicious looking dog jumps on her, knocks over her arrangement. I believe it shatters, shatters her vase. Uh, it's a Great Dane, Great Dane dog. The photographer yells, who owns that dog? Nobody comes to claim it. And that's just that scene. Yeah. Which, by the way, I've never met a vicious Great Dane before in my life. Me neither. I mean, to be fair, I haven't met many vicious dogs, luckily. But I just feel like Great Danes are known to be sleepy giants, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. But, you know, any, any dog could be vicious if their owner trains them to be. So, of course. Um, so I, guess, I guess that's the case. But I just felt like it was a weird, weird choice. It was. And what struck me about this is Nancy's very shaken up over the dog episode. Mm -hmm. We see her with dogs in other stories. It's fine. She even is really good with dogs in Shadow Ranch. And an aggressive dog comes up to her and she's like, no. And the dog just like. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this, he doesn't even touch her. He knocks over this vase. She's so shaken up about it. It says she was very alarmed over it. Yeah. But not over the car chase, the scene where this man grabs you in the dark and starts mm -hmm. threatening you. Someone shows up at your house and starts threatening you. None of that faces her. Mm -hmm. But this does. I just think it's a little funny. Yeah. Let's see what else happens. She figures out that singing horses must be the new password that's been changed from Bluebells. Right. And then um, they go to the Cornings to have dinner and she to learn about uh, Helen's family's grandparents' issues. Yeah, we get we get a little bit of a description of Nancy's outfit: a lime green dress with a magic sweater, which is cute. And then she goes to meet Helen and Jim, and they drive to her grandparents' house. They talk about Bess and George, who are apparently on vacation in California, but are coming home tomorrow. So I thought that was interesting. Bess and George, it seems, may take more vacations than even Nancy, apparently. But I bet theirs are a little bit more relaxing. Yes. <laughs> They're mysteries. So they get there, and they're introduced uh, immediately to Morgan, the houseman, which I thought was a weird job title. Mm -hmm. Um not a butler or a housekeeper, a houseman. A houseman. houseman. Housekeeper is too feminine. We have to masculinize oh. this this term, <laughs> I guess. It's so weird. So I'd never heard that before, but I, I mean, I assume he does all the same things that a housekeeper or a butler would do. Right. <laughs> anyway, so they have dinner and apparently that's normal. We get no real description of that. But afterwards, they go into the living room and... Helen's grandmother, Mrs. Corning, goes to draw the drapes. But Helen's like, no, 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 leave them open. I want Nancy to see it. And, and Nancy's like, what? Ooh, see <laughs> what? Um, and we find out that there has been a weird fiery blue circle appearing and coming closer to the house every night. And they're sure that it's a warning of some kind. Mm -hmm. They say, Nancy, can you please take a look? Yeah. So it appears, and Nancy and Helen run out there with Jim to go mm -hmm. investigate. But Helen accidentally turns her ankle and screams because the fiery blue thing starts coming closer to them, which, you know, understandable a little bit. I would scream too. Yeah, probably. And then, and then the circle just vanishes. So that's mysterious. Mm -hmm. Nancy tries to investigate, but she can't really see a lot in the dark. So she goes back into the house. And basically she tells them like, yeah, I want to investigate the blue, <laughs> the blue fire. <laughs> and they actually ask her to stay over because they're scared. Oh, but they do. So they do talk about Morgan. Yeah. They say that 
they're going to go get Morgan to make some tea for them to calm their nerves. Right. And this is when they, they can't find Morgan. Suspiciously, he's just gone from the house. Mm-hmm. And we learn that he's been acting kind of weird as well. He has been wandering around fully dressed. He's been looking scared. He's been jumpy. Um, We keep asking him what's the matter, but he won't tell us. Sometimes he's just missing altogether. And then he just has a weird excuse for why he was gone, where he went. Right. Um, Nancy says, perhaps he needs medical help. And then Mrs. Corning like, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I'm sure the issue is the blue fire, which it is. But like, if you think maybe he needs medical help, maybe you should get him medical help. Like, right. I just <laughs> like maybe step one, you know, I don't know. Maybe just rule it out mm-hmm. to be safe. Anyway, um, they, they say that a letter came in the mail for him and that it was just a, um, it's a blank greeting card. Blank greeting card. And they noticed that this kind of freaked him out. But they didn't notice anything strange about it. Nancy asked if they told the police about it. They didn't because Morgan told them not to tell the police about it. Yeah. And then they asked Nancy to stay over because they would feel better if she did, which I thought was sweet. You know, or I guess Jim and Helen stay as well. So they stay over and they're like, oh, I'm sure he'll be back by morning. They wake up. He's not back by morning. Mm-hmm. His bed's not slept in, so they decide to go search for him to see if maybe he's out in the woods somewhere or injured, needs their help. So they go to look for him. <laughs> um, when they, they come back, um, they find a note that he had left that said, don't worry, it's fine. Don't call the police. I'll be back later. I would immediately call the police. Yeah. What if he'd written this under duress? We don't know what's really going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Even Helen says, uh, Grandpa, I think you should call the police now, <laughs> kind of a thing. And they say, No, we'll do as Morgan asks. And they, so kind of not to spoil anything or not to get ahead of ourselves, like they keep doing this. Mm-hmm. And like, even after they find out like some concerning things about Morgan, and even after, you know, like more unreliability like they continue to be like no no he asked us not to no no we shouldn't invade his privacy no no which i guess good on you for sticking to your guns or whatever but like i feel like as things escalate maybe you do want to reconsider maybe you want to just investigate a little bit more so saying well this is his handwriting so yeah back soon (laughs) so they're freaked out about that but Mr. and Mrs. Corning would feel safer if someone stayed at night. Mm-hmm. And Helen kind of looks concerned about this and says, oh, I wish I could stay. But and then Mrs. Corning says, no, no, your place is with your husband. <gasps> so that- she can't take a few days to look after her elderly grandparents who are frightened to death in their own home. What the heck is that? What I is know. that? I don't know. <laughs> like, certainly it's not unusual for someone to stay with family, even for a short amount of time. Like, for it, oh. yeah. you need to be with your husband. Nancy could do it. So, Nancy says, No problem. I'm happy <laughs> to, but I do have this other mystery. So, I'm going to go home tonight, but I'll be back tomorrow. Um, and I think Helen actually suggests you should invite Bess and George up here with you as well. Mm-hmm. I'd be interested in getting my hands on the original 30s version to see if Bess and George were as big of a a role in this story. I think they are, with how much they're involved at the end part. Anyway. So anyway, after, um, so she stays, she stays again, right? Well, we go, we go back home to River Heights. um, And this is where we see Ify is in the kitchen. I think she's cooking. Did you say Ify? Ify, Effie? I think it's Effie. I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea. Uh, so Effie's in the kitchen. Oh, we're talking about the pigeon. This is the pigeon. <laughs> yeah. The neighbor boy, I guess, comes over. We don't know jo- Johnny, but Nancy knows him because she knows everyone in River Heights. She right. says, hi, Johnny. What's going on? Effie says, don't touch the pigeon in that box in the backyard. Uh, so, of course, he releases touches, the bird. <laughs> touches the, the, the box with the pigeon in the backyard. And then the pigeon flies away, and Nancy has to race after it, and she takes Effie with her. I 
am so confused because she seems so annoyed with Effie about letting the pigeon loose or whatever. And like, this wasn't Effie's fault. Like this was little Johnny's fault. I was so mad at little Johnny. He was so frustrating. <laughs> I know. Maybe you should be mad at Johnny too, Nancy, instead of at Effie. But um, she just seems kind of annoyed with her. Um, because she, so she gets in the car, we're in the next chapter now, and she gets into the car with Effie and they're chasing down this pigeon and she keeps telling Effie to watch the pigeon, watch the pigeon where it's flying and I'll drive and you can tell me where to go or whatever. And then, so they, they see that it goes into or flies down a driveway and that leads to like a house and they drive into this estate and there's like, a, a pistol a pistol goes off someone like shoots into the air or something and she's incredibly startled and this man comes out and is like scared you didn't i and it's, it's just like my whip <laughs> Ugh. oh yeah his whip oh gross. it wasn't even a pistol it just sounded like that because he cracked it toxic masculinity ruins the party again so she starts questioning the man about the pigeon, say, I want to I want to buy some pigeons as an excuse for being there. She's trying to look around a little bit. And she kind of gets a weird vibe from this guy right away. And he almost picks up on this and starts coming after her. She starts making excuses to leave and he does not want her to go. Yeah. She tries to like get into her car almost. Yeah. Try to pull out the keys from the ignition so she cannot leave. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I feel like the, the kinds of assaults in this book are like very, like the typical assault that women have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Like, especially at the beginning and especially now, like him trying to manipulate her to stay, him trying to physically stop her from getting in the car and leaving. Like that is all very like common forms <laughs> of men trying to control women's behavior. And so I just thought that that was, yeah, that it's just, it just feels very familiar and it feels very real and it feels very, yeah, I just feel like it really, it really paints the gender dynamic in this book and the series and like a very like realistic, a realistic way. Absolutely. The yeah. more, I guess, tense situations in this book feel more high stakes. They're a lot scarier than yeah. what we've seen in the other stories so far. For sure. I mean, not that I wouldn't be scared of like my horse getting stranded in the middle of a, a flowing river when it's going to flood. It just seems like that's a situation you could avoid. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather be in that situation than in this situation where this man I don't know is trying to force me to stay when he has this whip that he's been cracking around. and So creepy questioning me about where I'm going and mm -hmm. no. And so he reaches into the car to t turn it off, but saved by Effie who giggles weirdly. She giggles. Mm -hmm. She doesn't scream or shout or anything. She giggles and he hears her in the trunk. Yeah. And Nancy's able to zoom out of there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. way to go Effie. Weird response, but uh, I guess it worked. <laughs> and Nancy says, your giggles saved the day. And then it says to calm the excited girl. Nancy suggested they have lunch in a hotel coffee shop. And it's like, literally, she's two years younger than you, Nancy. Like, it's just, it just seems very patronizing. It does. Yeah. Uh, they learn that the owner of the mansion that she was just at with the pigeons name is Adolf Tuker. <laughs> what a name. What a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Adolf, first of all. And then is it Tuker? Tuker, who Tuker, knows? Tucker, right between the world wars, sandwich right in there. We're going to name our bad guy Adolf. Mm -hmm. Good decision. Great. And they mentioned that they learned that he has a plane. Hmm. Where have we seen a plane before? Mm -hmm. And Nancy recognizes it as the plane that she saw at the beginning of the book. And she thought for a moment that she had found the gang's hideout, but she realized that there was no Larkspur at that house. So can't be here. It, can't, it can't have been the right one. And so at that point, she re realizes or decides that there must have been two separate hideouts and that she needs to be looking for another one as well. Um, but they go home. Let's see. She calls Bess and George and invites them to the Corning's house to stay with her. And we get our first mention of uh, Dave and Bert. And Ned. Mm -hmm. The boys are working as summer camp counselors. Happens to be just across the lake from where the Cornings live. So how convenient. Yep. The boys can meet us there. <laughs> oh, so she... Uh, 
She's going home. She sees a sedan kind of similar to the one that kidnapped the doctor at the beginning of the story Mm -hmm. sitting outside her house. She tries to go in and she can't open the front door. It opens a little bit, but somehow um, it seems stuck. And so she calls through the door to Effie and Effie comes and opens it and says that two men tried to get into the house and that she barricaded the door to keep them out. Like this is intense this is getting yeah. really scary. It is. It's getting very scary. And it's at this point, Carson comes home and it's at this point that they basically all leave. Like Carson, uh, Effie and Hannah leave to go stay um, at Hannah's sister's house, Effie's mom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Carson and Nancy book it out the back. Like they, Nancy's going to go stay with the Cornings and then uh, Mr. Drew's going to take her there and then go to he, his flying somewhere for work or something all this happens not before dad gives a big announcement to nancy oh right the price that he has for her (laughs) nancy her car is a little too recognizable to our bad guys they've been following her around they know what her car looks like now so his solution buy her a new car oh what a charmed life the charmed life of nancy drew get a brand new convertible and that's great. Congrats on your new car, Nancy. That's a very nice gift, Carson. But uh, for no read, like no occasion. Yeah. Other than just like surprise, I wanted to get you a new car. Here's a new car. Maybe consider not a convertible with all the trouble Nancy has. <laughs> people maybe following her around, yeah. seeing her in her car. Maybe opt for not a convertible where the bad guy can't throw himself into your car and try to pull the keys out of the ignition while you're trying to drive away. So Nancy has her new car. They're going to drive around back, swap out the cars, fool these guys, and get back to the morning's house. Um, Which they do, and Carson leaves, and Nancy goes to bed. The next day, they... um, they go to run some errands because Mrs. Corning has to go to the department store and she goes to check in with the jeweler that we visited earlier to see if he has learned anything about the family crest, which he has. Um, he's found out that it, it happens belongs- to be, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, it, it belongs to the Eldridge family who lives in or around St. Louis. So this is our incident with the boat. We're on the, we're on the dock, Bess and George and Nancy are going to go out swimming and sunbathing. And we see a family also on the dock, there's a little girl with them. Does she jump in or does she fall in? She she falls in. So like someone screams her name or something or yeah, someone screams her name. She's startled and she falls into the water and uh, a boat at the same time, which I guess a speedboat of some kind is like driving directly towards the child. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Nancy, ever the courageous lady that she is jumps into the water to save the child and like grabs her and like swims down mm-hmm. um to give the boat time to pass yeah yeah protect them from the boat and then they're they're able to swim back up um and the child's fine mom is so so grateful um, yeah. that we learned that this is marie eldridge this is the eldridge family oh the coincidence Mm-hmm. It's kismet. <laughs> Falls in Nancy's lap, but she Nancy's talking to the mom. She says, "Any chance you're from St. Louis?" And Mrs. Eldridge says, "Why, yes. How did you know?" Mm-hmm. Uh, Learn that her husband's aunt has been missing for some time, or his great aunt, his aunt. Um, yeah, his aunt. And the bracelet is recognized as having belonged to Aunt Mary. Um, and then we also learn that she has a necklace, right? Yeah, matching necklace. A matching necklace. Um, and that she's going to show this to Nancy. Maybe, maybe. Anyway, Nancy tells them that she thinks that her aunt is in the area and being held there. Um, and that she's going to try looking for her. And the woman is so happy about this or whatever. And is going to call her husband to tell him to come back from New York where he's currently looking for her. And then. This is where our boys show up. Our boys show up. And Bert and Dave arrive. And, Okay. <laughs> So we get so we get a good description of Bert and Dave. Bert is described um, as husky and blonde, and also they say that he was George's special friend. So I always I thought that was interesting because in my mind, I always thought that Bess 
was the was the one who was dating one of these boys but i guess they do eventually all date each other anyway so mm -hmm. whatever i just thought it was interesting that they called out george as being bert's special friend instead of dave being bess's special friend right but he is you know that he is right, right. they just don't mention that here um dave is being described as a rangy boy with fair hair and green eyes but ned all we get about ned is that he's tall and handsome which i just thought was such a letdown like i want to hear about ned's fair hair and green eyes or whatever colors they are um but all we get is tall and handsome and i do wonder i mean it's possible that they describe him earlier in the books so they might think it's unnecessary to redescribe him now but it does also make me wonder if maybe it was a choice to be a little bit light on the description um to make him more in the same way that they do that with protagonists a lot of the time to so that you can imagine yourself as that character so right. i wonder if this is a tactic to do that to make him seem like everybody's boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, intentionally vague, so you can just kind of fill in your yeah. preferred traits of right. what, you, what you like about Ned Nickerson. <laughs> yeah, but so they tell them about the mystery, um, and they go back up to the house with them, and they invite them to a yacht club dance, or the Cornings invite the boys and Nancy and her friends to a yacht club dance. So I guess these are supposed to be some really wealthy people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yes, absolutely, we'll go. Um, and then they leave. Um, and Nancy goes to um, investigate the woods a little bit more to see if she can find out anything about the mysterious blue circle. She All, all she finds is some scorched brown wrapping paper. And she kept those pieces. And she, um, she was thinking she was going to ask Ned about them, which I thought was a weird, kind of a weird aside. Yeah, we learned that Ned is just really good at chemistry. Yeah. So. What a great fun fact about Ned. He, yeah, he's into chemistry. We find out later at the the yacht club dance that yeah, he 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 does. He knows what this is. He knows how this kind of thing could have been constructed. Um and so he is incredibly helpful to Nancy, which mm -hmm. is cool. And that brings us to, to chapter 10. Yeah. Nancy and Bess and George decide to go on a little drive around to see if they can find the second headquarters of this pigeon communicating gang. They find a few dead ends. Nothing really comes of it. So they decide to head back. Is this when it's... No, this is when they, this is when they go to the yacht club dance. And then by one o'clock they're ready for bed and they go home and go to bed. But in the middle of the night... Um, Nancy uh, hears a noise and she grabs a flashlight and she goes downstairs and she finds Morgan um, who had been missing, who's just reappeared. And he's like on his hands and knees and it looks like he's like looking for something. And she's like, you know, what are you doing? Um, and he says he dropped the key. Nancy finds the key and he says, sorry, I disturbed you basically. And Nancy's trying to get information from him. Like, where have you been? What's going on? What's wrong? And he's like, nothing's wrong. I'll explain everything in the morning. Shuts the door to his room and like locks her out. Mm -hmm. Nancy's talking to the Cornings the next morning after breakfast. He, Morgan had begged their forgiveness. Um, and they mentioned that he had really great references when he first was hired by them. So Nancy decides to call those references and see if they can't figure out why he might be acting strangely or what he might be so frightened or shaken up by. Yes. And so apparently they, they go to church that afternoon and they have lunch. And when they come back, there is a knock on the door and there's a parcel given to them. It's addressed to Morgan. Um, and Nancy goes to the courtings about it and is like, basically like, can I open the package? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, absolutely not. Which I think is probably, uh, that's a fair play at that point, I think. Like, you can't just open other people's nail mail, Nancy, even if they've been acting suspiciously. <laughs> but she goes to give it to Morgan and he opens it right in front of her. So that's, that's handy. Um, and inside the package is some stalks of Larkspur. And he's very stunned to see this. He looks almost frightened by receiving these flowers in the mail. He faints. He faints dead away. And uh, yeah, he slumps to the floor. She tries to like wake him up. She like slaps his face. <laughs> and she has to get like a wet towel 
and like pat him and a couple a couple minutes later he he comes to and he moans something about last warning tomorrow night which nancy takes to mean that the house is going to be robbed tomorrow night and that this these flowers were some kind of warning about that and nancy also reveals to us that she did call the people who wrote the letters of recommendation for morgan they all said i've never heard of this man he doesn't right. exist so that's sketchy mm-hmm. let's see so she tells her dad about it they they check he that he had checked in with the police they haven't been able to find adam thorne Nancy makes the assumption that this is somehow related to Adam Thorne, that they know each other somehow, and Adam Thorne is the one behind these threats. They go swimming with Ned Burt and Dave. Um, they have like a diving competition. It's kind of weird. Obviously, Nancy does exceptionally mm -hmm. swimming or diving. That's diving. I need to add that to the list. That's a pretty good skill. It it's is not a pretty good thing skill. to do. So after they go swimming, Ned, Dave, and Bert give them their coats to keep warm. And it's a good thing that they do because they are walking down to the beach to a bonfire um, down a very steep hill. And someone shoves Bess. Bess almost goes off the cliff. Right. Um, yeah. But it's saved at the last moment. Nancy kind of devises that, oh, they must have not recognized this in the dark. They meant to push me. So Nancy feigns, feigns an injury. Mm -hmm. To try to trick them into thinking that they did, in fact push her and that she is just out of commission or whatever. Right. Um, so they um, they go home, they call the doctor to try to like further this charade or whatever. The doctor plays along with the charade. <laughs> Everybody does a really good job of faking Nancy's injury. Everyone is very willing to help Nancy, yeah. Um, and then Nancy comes up with a plan. I'm not sure for what, hang on. Oh, yeah, Nancy devises a plan for catching the robbers right. with Ned Burt's and Dave's help. Mm -hmm. So they're going to, or they're essentially going to trap the robbers in a room in the Corning's house because this is where they keep their display case of Miss Corning's fancy crystals that she has in her jewels. Mm -hmm. so they're going to set up this trap for them and they set up the trap and they catch Morgan. He's the one that comes in to steal the jewels. Um, Morgan kind of gets guilty at the last second and fesses up. I can't do this. I can't go through with it. But so did, that doesn't happen right away, though, right? That happens in like the next chapter. Yeah. Does it? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. It's just first they um, go to find the Larkspur house. They oh, try. Oh. They try again. Um, and they, they do find the house and this, like a woman that they had run into the day before had told them where it was. And so they go to this house and they find that, it, you know, it is Larkspur Lane, right? And they try to get into it. So they like park the car in the brush and they like go to, to walk towards the, the house and yeah, they try to get inside, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they can't, they basically decide that they they can't get in because it's too dangerous and they go back to the courting's house. And this is where they then, yeah, they lay the plot and they, they catch Morgan in the trap set for the thieves trying to steal Mrs. Corning's crystals, crystal wear, whatever. But Morgan kind of explains to Nancy that he's been threatened and blackmailed by this, group of criminals and that he didn't want to he doesn't want to steal any of this stuff and so nancy kind of takes pity on him um and is trying to help him get out of it yeah adam thorne is the one who actually forged the letters of recommendation for him so he could get the job right i guess they met each other when they were in prison and now that adam thorne has broken out he wants repayment for that favor 15 years ago right so morgan feels really bad about it nancy is going to attempt to like keep him away from the other criminals because they've threatened him, but he doesn't want Nancy to come to harm or get in trouble or anything. So he runs out of the house and basically is going to tell them that he's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. But Nancy tries to stop him and runs after him and someone grips Nancy's shoulder and like basically flung her and she falls to the ground and blacks out. Mm hmm hits her head and then wakes up. Morgan is gone. Bess and George and Miss Corning are standing over her. They found her just on the driveway. Luckily, I guess they didn't realize who she was or they probably would have kidnapped her as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. 
Nancy is put in some incredibly seriously dangerous situations in this. Like this is, I think the most seriously we've seen her injured. Like she actually loses consciousness. I, we haven't seen that yet mm-hmm. in our read throughs, but yeah, they could have also kidnapped her at that point. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, she says she's okay. Other than a headache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's totally fine, and now they can go back to Larkspur Lane to check out the mansion that they were previously unable to get into. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is when they, um, so George turns her ankle. Yeah, we're outside the fence, the barbed wire fence surrounding the, the property of this mansion. George turns her ankle, so they just have to kind of leave her there. <laughs> yeah, and Bess and Nancy kind of move ahead to get closer to the house. And this is when they um, see the old woman on the other side of the fence. Well, um, they see a bunch of old ladies first, oh, yeah. just kind of sitting out there in their wheelchairs on the lawn. And they notice this one woman is just kind of off by herself. And so they go over to try to talk to her. Mm-hmm. And they, they notice the necklace that she is wearing is similar to the bracelet that Nancy has. And they believe this to be the necklace that um, the other Eldridge, Mrs. Eldridge, that we met before was referring to. Mm-hmm. So they believe this to be Mrs. Eldridge. And they um, talk to her. They go up to the fence and they talk to her. And basically, oh, so first she's with a nurse. We see some staff from this, this mansion, this sanatorium, best calls it. Um, and they all seem to be pretty abusive to these old people. They're really mm-hmm. mean to them and threatening them. Yeah, the old woman is crying, and she's basically like, "Stop! Like, stop crying! Stop whining!" Or kind else. of a thing. Yeah, or else. So that's very scary um, and very sad. But the nurse leaves, and Nancy and Bess are able to go up to her, and she, the old woman, is like, "Oh, what brave young girls!" <laughs> Um, and they basically say, like, oh, we're going to try to get in to rescue you. Oh, also, Nancy realizes that the nurse is the woman who stole her handbag oh, yeah. in the apartment store. Oh, yeah. The doctor comes out after the nurse goes away, Dr. Bell. Um, and he is essentially badgering Mrs. Eldridge while Nancy and Bess and George are hiding behind a tree on the other side of the fence saying, um, you need to give me more money, implying that she'd already paid a significant amount of money to be there. Um, essentially, he has promised her a everlasting youth potion or some, something of the sort. What does he call it? A miracle cure. Yeah, a miracle cure for aging. Um, and she needs to give him more money before he is able to go live with this this medicine that he has. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs. Eldridge doesn't fall for it and calls him a brute, says, I've wasted enough of my money on you. And is very sneaky and very craftily says, if only some good angel would come to my little room in that hot south corner on the third floor and rescue me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But so the girls can't get in yet. Um, so they leave. Nancy calls Ned and alerts him to the plan. They take George to a doctor for her ankle, which turns out is just sprained. Mm-hmm. Oh, on the way out of the place, they hear the doctor telling someone that they're getting a new patient in oh, yeah. that night. So Nancy starts hatching her plan based on this. Right, right, right. Yeah, so she calls Ned and she cooks up a plan with Ned. Um, as to how they're going to get into the sanatorium, this house, and save Mrs. Eldridge, and I guess all the rest of the patients as well. They can't call the police. They consider this a few times, but they can't call the police because the people working there will do something awful to the old ladies, or the old ladies will have a heart attack, basically, at the shock of having police officers run through the door. So they don't want that to happen. So that's completely off the table for reasons that don't really make a lot of sense sure Uh, um so we accept that little bit of uh you know suspending disbelief for the plot's sake and um we (laughs) we start enacting the plan so george is their getaway driver because of her sprained ankle or no sorry george stays outside yeah Bess is the driver Bess is the getaway driver right and Bess and nancy drive into the uh well, first, first Nancy goes shopping and gets herself right. a get up, <laughs> this long black dress and a black hat with a black veil over it. She's dressing up as an old lady. She's going to be the patient arriving at nine, but they're going to get there a few minutes early. Bess is going to drive her. Um, and this is how they're going to sneak onto the grounds. Pretty clever. Pretty clever. They also make use of the password 
Um, that's how they're able to get in. Nancy remembers from the pigeon message that the password is now singing horses, and it works, and they're able to get in. Um, so they, they pull the car off to where you can't really see it. Does Beth stay in the car? Beth stays in the car. And Nancy ventures into the building. Yeah. She sneaks through. She has to hide in a closet at one point because someone's coming down the hallway, um, like the closet directly outside of Mrs. Eldridge's home, uh, not home, her room. room. And when the nurse goes into her room and really quite abuses this old woman, Mm -hmm. um, she's able to come out and stuff some fabric in the door jam so that the door doesn't latch when it shuts. Um, and so then she's able to get in once the, the nurse leaves and go and speak to Mrs. Eldridge. So she does. She gets into the room and then we hear the nurse come right back because Mrs. Eldridge screamed yeah. upon seeing Nancy, not realizing who she was. Well, this part was so funny because Nancy uh, says, uh, hold on, let me find it, let me find it. Don't worry about that. The thing to do now is for you to get out of here. I hope no one heard you scream. But as she spoke, she heard someone running down the hall. I heard Mrs. Eldridge scream. <laughs> I just thought that was uh, a funny little juxtaposition. Uh, I hope no one heard you scream. I heard her scream. <laughs> so, good. so Nancy jumps under the bed to hide. The nurse comes back in, demands to know why she screamed. Miss Eldridge makes up an excuse. The nurse is horrible again and accuses her of just doing it to make trouble. Mm-hmm says the doctor's been so kind to you why don't you just sign over sign over your money to him but she you know she refuses again but then then the nurse continues to kind of bully her and says um actually you know what i'm going to do you've been acting funny i'm going to search your room and um so at this point we're supposed to be pretty scared because nancy's hiding under the bed (laughs) so we don't want the nurse to search the room because she's going to find nancy Um, But Mrs. Eldridge is clever. Um, She's proven herself to be pretty clever. And she says, well, go ahead and search. What do I care? Kind of implying that, you know, nothing is hidden there. Um, And so the nurse is like, you're right. It's a waste of time. Whatever. I'm going to (laughs) leave. We do have a a pretty common pattern of huge cliffhanger at the end of the chapter. And then within a paragraph or two, uh, never mind. It's actually not that big a deal. It it all ends up being okay very quickly. Very quick dismissal of the the cliffhanger at the end of the the chapter. In the course of all this, we find out that essentially the doctor, Dr. Bell, goes out, finds these wealthy old women, convinces them, hey, I'm working on this youth serum, this forever young medicine. I don't even know what he calls it. Um, You're going to come stay with me. You're going to sign this saying that you are entering this facility of your own accord um, and uses that basically to threaten them. If you try to leave, I'm not going to let you because you agreed to be under my care. um, And basically you can't leave until I get X amount of money from you. Yeah. We also learn that they drug the women in that house. We, she says that their food is cooked with, with drugs and it keeps them drowsy. So quite, you know, quite the elder abuse going on here. Um, so, but anyway, Nancy is able to escape with Mrs. Eldridge down a service, uh, a flight of service stairs. They go outside. She's able to get her in the back of the car quickly. And Bess is able to drive off and drive out of the estate with her. Mm-hmm. So Mrs. Eldridge is safe. Nancy, however, stays behind um, because she needs to enact part two of her plan, which is to get to the pigeon coop to send a a carrier pigeon to Ned to alert him to send the police. Which is very exciting. A little confusing to me in the plot point why Ned wasn't just automatically planning to call the police anyway at a certain point. Um, Why Bess can't be the one to call Ned and say, hey, we're good. You call the police. Nancy then has to take an extra dangerous step. Instead of getting out with Bess and Mrs. Eldridge, she has to stay just to get to the pigeon coop. Right. To send a message. It is a little little convoluted and confusing. It seems like... (laughs) This could have been simpler. And also, like, it, was it just Mrs. Eldridge you were worried about? Like, there are other women in the home. Like, I thought we were concerned about their well-being if a police stormed in or whatever. But I guess not. <laughs> it also has to stay to turn on the lights on the airfield where the 
the plane that they own will land. Uh, right. But we'll get to that. Yeah, because so we so we find out Nancy overhears the doctor, Dr. Bell, saying that their plan is to get a little bit more money and then leave to go to South America. Um, what kind of what kind of cult is this that all these <laughs> nurses just sign on to go abuse elders and try to trick them into stealing their money so that they can all leave and go do like farm Jonestown in South America? I guess. I mean, so I, later I think Nancy mentioned something about that woman, Miss Tyson, not being an actual nurse. So I'm assuming that the the women here or whoever the nurses are are not are also not actually you know, quote unquote, nurses. I think they're all oh, right. just, just criminals, just willing to abuse older women, I guess. Yeah. So, um, but Nancy gets caught. Yeah, we have to, well, we have this whole chase around the grounds of this. She ends up in the attic of the building where oh, she finds Morgan. Morgan. Yeah, Morgan. But she leaves him uh, because she's got to get to the pigeons. That's the main goal. She's got to get to the pigeons. Yeah, Morgan is too weak to even move. So he's got to stay there. Mm-hmm. Um, but she gets held up by the dog, basically. The Great Dane sniffs her out, and they catch her. And they put her in a, a well, or a cistern, I guess, technically. But, like, they put her down a well. This dungeon in this old mansion. It's so strange. It's really gross and incredibly scary. It reminds me of that part. There's there's a well in one of the games. There's a, It's a... Uh, the one in Captain Germany. Curse. Yeah, Captive Curse. <laughs> and she goes down the well. But she does go down on the well on purpose in that game. Yeah, of her own accord, not because she's thrown into a pit. Right. And kind of the sinister, the the bad guys who, who catch her, which is now Adam Thorne and his whole gang with, with the doctor. But she's able to, like, claw and nail out of the ladder and carve, like, handholds in the brick. Mm-hmm. In the wall. Yeah. In the wall so that she can climb to like this somewhat of a passageway. Oh, it's like a, uh, like a trap door in yeah. the ceiling, right? That leads out into oh, right. the ground floor of where the pigeons are. Right. Yes. So she, yeah. So the cistern actually is a wider at the bottom than it is at the top. So there's like areas to the side that she can move to. And that is where she climbs up the wall and finds the trap door. Which is very, very, it's ingenious of her first, but mm-hmm. also very scary. It says at one point she's like nine foot from the ground uh, while she's trying to get to the actual door. And if she falls, yikes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but she, she, she does, you know, she summons her bravery. Can, can we talk about the bottom of the cistern for a second, though? Because it's ankle deep, cold water, moist walls. But like it, it's a slimy floor with floor with fragments, and she has to like feel around it with her hands. Like it's incredibly, I mean, graphic. I don't, I don't know, if graphic is the right word, but it's like gross it's and upsetting. scary. Yeah, it's incredibly upsetting to think about being trapped in like this dark hole. So I just, I found that probably one of the most upsetting parts of the book. <laughs> oh, upsetting! Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really upsetting. But she's able to get out. She's able to get out directly into the pigeon loft, miraculously, um, and sends sends a message to Ned. And then, yeah, she goes to um, yeah, she goes to turn on the the floodlights. Is that right? At behind the mansion, there is an airfield essentially where there's a yes. landing strip for the plane, and there's I guess lights that are hidden in the ground, so you can't see them during the day. But Nancy needs to now get out of the pigeon coop run along the side of this house and go turn on these lights so that the police have a place to land their helicopter. Yeah. But on the way she meets Morgan and um, he, they had taken him down and put him in a car and garage. Yeah. And he said, she's like, how did you get here? And he says, they brought me down. They're going to finish me off to keep me from talking. And then they're going to escape. So they brought him down here to kill him. And Nancy only notices this because she happens to be running past the car and sees, oh, is there someone in there? Are they watching me? Mm-hmm. But no, it's just Morgan and he's about to be murdered. So, so. she lets the air out of the tires So with the nail. She put, mm-hmm. punches a hole in them so that they can't drive Morgan away, I guess. But then she still leaves him She there. leaves him. <laughs> yeah. 
she was like, okay, that's sorted. See ya. <laughs> That'll be good enough. You're safe now. And then continues on to go to turn on the lights at the, the airfield or, or wherever. But so she kind of, so she goes, she goes down there. <laughs> She turns on the lights and obviously they are alerted to the fact that these lights are on, but she's able to get up to the plane that is sitting there. And let all the fuel out of that, right? Yeah, she knows exactly where to, to go on the plane, where the fuel is exactly. What? Um, let me see exactly what it says. Um, Nancy knew that fuel drains were on the underside of the wings. <laughs> How? How does Nancy know that? Is Nancy an expert in aviation? I guess so. Apparently, and that's her list of expertise. Yeah, and um, she's able to drain all the fuel from the plane. Um, then she gets trapped there, though. The Great Dane, so one of the the criminals, brings the is leading the Great Dane down there, and he notices Nancy is there. So she's like hiding under the plane, basically, and other men are like running up behind them, including Adolf Tooker. <laughs> Or Tuker, or however you say his name. And they're arguing about who turned on the lights and what happened, right? And eventually, they pull the dog away to go investigate somewhere else. And, oh, because Miss Tyson is calling because something's gone wrong, um, I'm assuming, with the car. And Nancy is able to run away into the field and get away. They see her, though, and chase after her. But luckily... Um, yeah, at this exact moment, yeah, another plane swoops down soundlessly out of the sky and out jump a bunch of police officers, Carson and Ned. Ned! Ned to the rescue! And Dave and the pilot. And Dave and the yeah, yeah, yeah. And then another a helicopter, I guess, comes along with more police and Bert, mm -hmm. and they all jump out and arrest the criminals on the spot. And we get quite a bit of explanation from the criminals about their their plans and their, you know, uh, again, I, I just think it's always <laughs> the, you know, the Scooby-Doo moment where and I would have gotten away with the two if it weren't for you meddling kids kind of a thing. Right. They just immediately confess, yeah. lay out everything that they've done. <laughs> I always have such an issue with this in cop shows too, because there is always such um, an emphasis put on getting the criminals to confess. And mm -hmm. there's always like this big confession moment. And it's just so stupid to me because like literally like the whole point of like reading your Miranda rights, which I know wasn't a thing at this point, but the whole point of that is like, you have the right to remain silent. Don't just don't, just don't tell them don't start this. Admitting things like, or it's going to look a lot worse for you. Yeah. Don't tell the cops anything. They're not, like, they, you are only giving them more fodder to convict you anyway. But, you know, very helpfully, they tell them all about their plans and how they were fooling old women into, you know, giving them money and coming to the estate. Um, and then they were going to, you know, fly to South America. They also explain how they came up with the blue fire. And um, it, it was in a box so that as soon as they needed the fire to go away, they could just shut the door. It would disappear. Mm -hmm. That box was lined with asbestos. Fun story. <laughs> right. That's not a problem at all in the 60s. Uh, I don't really understand why it had to be a ring of blue fire, why they couldn't use a different warning message to Morgan. Um, it's just it's very specific that it had to be this ring of blue fire yeah i think it's just supposed to be generally spooky in the same way that um all of the like the weird coincidences are kind of generally spooky it seems very like you know uh faded kind of a thing anyway. yeah but then and then luckily um then john and marie and the other elder just come to be reunited uh, yes, to the Corning's house to be reunited with Mrs. Eldridge. Um, and it's a very, very sweet, the, the old woman is incredibly, um, she's very grateful. Yeah, happy. I'm incredibly grateful to Nancy for her help. So far as to say that she is going to give them the, the or she's going to give Nancy the bracelet as a memento <laughs> for solving this mystery. And also Mrs. Corning is going to award each of the girls with French crystal earrings in the form of tiny larkspurs. <laughs> so generous. So generous, also incredibly specific. Um, 
but very generous. And then Nancy protested that she wanted no reward. She was just happy. Everything turned out right. But I mean, I, I'm assuming that she still gets the gets the bracelet and the the earrings eventually. So earlier in the book too, I think like in chapter 10 or something, she talks about how she has a profession or someone, oh, I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. So when they're, when they're swimming with uh, Ned Burt and Dave and some of their camp friends, um, one of them says, oh, you do such a great job diving. Do you want a job as a camp counselor? And then she says, thank you, but I already have a job. And I'm like, Nancy, no, you don't have a job. You don't, get, you don't get paid for your detective work, except apparently she gets some very nice crystal earrings and incredibly expensive jewelry. So, you know, I take it back. Maybe, you know, maybe she, she does get paid. It's lucrative enough, even though she refuses the payment or the, the reward every time. Yeah. But what a great book. It was. This was a really good one. How many flashlights would you give this one? Five out of five flashlights. I would also give it five. I really enjoyed this book. This was a good one. Um, so let us know how you enjoyed Password to Larkspur Lane if you are uh, reading these w along with us. All right. Well, should we announce our book for, for next week? Yes. So we randomly chose number 22. The Clue in the Crumbling Wall. I have no, yeah, no reference for what this is about. I have I have very little or to no memory. I mean, I remember the cover, but that that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, excited too. Should be a good one. So tomorrow, our April puzzle is going to go live on our social media account. So we, we do have another question for you this month. If you want to head over to our Instagram or our Twitter tomorrow, um, and instead of letting us know what the question is, tell us what your answer would be to that question. And also, before we end the episode, I just want to say, since we announced our the start of our podcast and our premiere date and everything, we've gotten an incredible response from people online. A lot of people have reached out to us, telling us how excited they are for this podcast and even offering to help out a little bit. And I just want to say I appreciate every single person that has reached out to us. We are really excited for you to, to start hearing our episodes, um, and we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, it's incredibly heartening to see people as excited about this as we are. Um, so we're really glad that you're listening. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. And also, I just wanted to give a shout out to our very first patron over on Patreon, Natalie Phillips. Natalie, thank you so much for your patronage. Your support means so much to us. So we're so happy to have you. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at regularnancydrew and Twitter at regularnd. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening.